Hello and welcome to the Falcon IT Services Cybersecurity 2024 Part 2 Physical Security. Password Hygiene Even with strong passwords, programs like the ones listed below can brute force attack your passwords relatively easily. In the case where physical access is granted, like a lost notebook, passwords can be easily reset by booting from an OS utility and resetting the password in the user's SAM database. This allows the person with the stolen device to gain access in minutes. Encrypting the drive is the only way to ensure that a stolen device is secured. So basically, um, you know, we, we all have laptops that we use. Sometimes we take them home because we work from home. It is extremely important to protect your devices. Don't leave them in the trunk of your car. And, um, you know, make sure that if you have important data on there that the drive is encrypted. Also, things that also you don't take into consideration sometimes is, for example, if we take our computer somewhere to be repaired, even if we don't give our Windows passwords to the person that's repairing it, uh, that person just having access to that computer, they can actually remove the drive, connect it to another device, and read the files that are in it. And the only way to protect against this is by encrypting the contents. And um, lastly, a, a lost or stolen device uh, can be booted from a an operating system and have its passwords reset. So the user can then log in as you. And if you have, for example, uh, saved passwords in your browsers or you have confidential information in the computer, not only can that information be accessed, but people can actually, or whoever gets in that computer, can actually then visit a website like for example, your, your email, and go in there because the password has been saved in your browser. So again, if you lose your device, it's relatively easy for someone with um, a moderate level of expertise to get into that device. Don't leave passwords on sticky notes under your keyboard or in your desk drawers where people can see them. Um, I did, this is I'm obvious, but I want to say that anyways because I do see that periodically um, and it's really not a good place to keep your passwords because then somebody could see it, sit in your computer, log in as you and impersonate you. Don't set the password hint and password to be the same or don't set it to be an obvious hint. Um, I actually don't even like password hints. Um, but if you have to use it, make sure that, for example, if your password is baseball123, that your password hint isn't also baseball123. And by the way, baseball123 is not a good password. We're going to learn about that in a minute. Log off from your desktop session when you leave your desk. This is to prevent somebody from sitting down, accessing your computer, and doing something as you. Don't save passwords in your browser. If your computer is accessed, your browser will automatically let the intruder into your websites. Many browsers allow saved passwords to be viewed and some viruses steal saved passwords from the browser. Again, it's convenience and security. It's very convenient if our browser saves our password so that when you go to your email, when you go to your whatever website you go to, you don't have to continually enter your password but there's two problems by you not having to enter it you're never going to memorize it that's number one and number two if somebody does get into your computer either because you got up and forgot to lock it or because you lost it and somebody is able to get into it then they can actually go to websites and it's going to log you in because your username and password is already saved and that's why it's not a good idea there's also um uh, you know, ways there, there, there are also viruses that can um, go and steal the passwords that you saved into your browser. And some browsers, if you go to the settings and you go to the security passwords, there's a little eyeball icon next to it. And if you click on the eyeball icon, it will uh, show the passwords in clear text. So if you get up from your desk, you leave it unlocked, somebody goes into your browser and they go into the settings, security passwords, they could click on those eyeballs and with their phone, take pictures of all your passwords and then later on, add gain access to your accounts. Do not store private information or passwords on your desktop using sticky notes, in your Outlook, um, on the computer notepad um, or anything like that. It's really not secure or even in an insecure network folder. 
If your computer has sensitive information stored locally, for example, my documents and your desktop, um, and that information is critical, um, that if somebody gets a hold of it, it could be a problem, then you should have your hard drive encrypted. You can call us and we'll do that for you. Also, um, if your computer has a lot of sensitive information or if you happen to work in a, in a division of your uh, organization where you um, have access to uh, uh, you know, important information or sensitive information, something that you have to be aware of is uh, a device like this called the Key Grabber. So what this device is, and as you can see here, uh, you can purchase it relatively inexpensively online. What this device is, is you plug it into the back of your computer and then you plug the keyboard into the back of this device. And what this device does is it captures everything you're typing into the keyboard and it, and, and it forwards it to the computer. Only it keeps a copy of it in its memory. And so if, if for example, uh, if you uh, leave at night and you forget to lock your office or if you go out to lunch, you forget to lock your office, um, somebody could come in, insert this device, you'll never know that it's there. Since it's hardware based, the antivirus will never find it. Um, as far as the computer is concerned, um, you know, it, it's just receiving keystrokes, uh, you know, from a, from a USB keyboard. Um, but again, the, the, a person could come in, install this device, you'll never know it. Then a few days later, um, they could come back, remove the device, take it home with them, and then they can access it and see everything that you have typed um, during that duration of time. So make sure that if you get up uh, uh, to go somewhere or if you go to lunch uh, or at the end of the day, leave your office locked, um, always under lock and key. And if you forget to lock your office one day, um, it's good to do a physical inspection and check your computer to make sure that uh, one of these devices has not been installed. Also, take into account um, the people that could have access to your office, such as the cleaning crew, things like that, where, um, you know, hackers always try to get um, uh, jobs in places where they, they could have access, right? They could kind of fly under the radar. And um, so if I was a hacker and I'm trying to steal information, getting a, a job at like a cleaning crew and things like that, that, that would be um, something that I would look at because then it would give me physical access to um, computers. So it, it's a good idea to uh, make sure that, that your cleaning crew um, um, is vetted, uh, you know, run background checks, things like that. Physical computer access, again, not only cleaning crew, but you have um, vendors that work at different companies that uh, will have access to your information systems. And um, so um, when you have a vendor such as phone vendors, security camera vendors, ISP, repair technicians, um, you should always take a copy of their ID, make a timestamp of when they come in, when they access your uh, computer room. And, um, you know, they should be supervised at all times. Physical IoT security. IoT devices, um, also known as Internet of Things, are devices such as, you know, as you can see here, uh, a thermostat. Um, but there, there are a lot of uh, different uh, IoT devices that, that have a range of functions. These days, a lot of devices are IoT. For example, you have smart refrigerators, you have smart uh, washing machines and dryers. Uh, a lot of things are, are, are connected now to a network. Now, in your place of business, you may have IT, IoT devices, you have sensors uh, that can measure temperature, you have sensors um, it, for, for uh, air quality, um, you could have um, all different kinds of uh, uh, DVRs, NVRs, IP cameras, um, you have uh, personal assistants that, that I've seen in workplaces, you have speakers, smart televisions, these are all IoT devices. And IoT devices are uh, relatively insecure in comparison to a lot of the other uh, devices that are on networks. Um, so always with an IoT device, you should have them on, a, on what's called a guest network segment. Do not connect them directly to your network. 
um, seg network segmentation is where you divide your network. You have one section that's secure and that's where you connect your PCs and then you have another section that's called the guest and it's separate so the two cannot touch and on your separate network is where you want to connect your IoT devices and also you want to give your employees Wi-Fi access so that they could connect their phones or their tablets or maybe even their personal laptops to a Wi-Fi um, but not to the same network where you are conducting business so um, Consider IoT and infected PCs when working from home. Infected devices could sniff traffic and launch exploits against other devices on your home network. Um, so if you're, a, a lot of us work from home um, these days and you're in a home network where they meet, where there may be a smart TV, where there may be thermostats, where there may be other devices. Um, you also have other computers that are your children's computer, your spouse's computer, and all these uh, devices, if one of them gets infected, it could sniff the network. And that's why it's very, very important um, to make sure that you are working from the most secure uh, network possible. If you see anything that's weird, you could call us. And also, um, when you have your managed computer on a, on, a, on a network, we have software that detects if there are uh, attempts at, at um, uh, accessing it, which is an indicator that there's another computer on the network that, uh, that may um, uh, be compromised. So um, if, if you see something strange, uh, please call the help desk and let us know and uh you know so that we can uh, investigate um if you're running off a home network and you're working from home media security as i mentioned earlier removed hard drives lose their security unless they're encrypted there's really no need for password cracking if um, you take your computer somewhere to get repaired if, if you look at this photo here at the bottom left <clears throat> Um, this is a hard drive that's been removed from a computer and it's connected uh, to a SATA to USB interface. And once you plug it in, the computer will recognize the hard drive and it's going to be able to read the contents completely bypassing passwords. So take into consideration uh, when you're taking your device somewhere to get repaired that uh, the removal of the hard drive uh, will allow somebody to access the contents of what's inside. Um, never. Uh, take your work computer to repair somewhere without consulting with us or with your management. Um, and um, if you do, make sure that the contents of the hard drive are encrypted if that, com if that hard drive contains any sensitive information that could put uh, you, you or your business at risk. <coughs> so how prevalent is this? Um, this... Um, uh, research here that was conducted by, um, as you can see here, Jason Sessi, uh, Johan Stegman, and a couple of others in, in Hassan Khan in uh, the university in Ontario. Um, they, they basically, they took um, 18 phones and they loaded up some software that would audit what was done on those phones to see what would happen when they took it to a repair facility. So first they tried to take it to a local repair facility, then they took it to a regional, and then they took it to a national. And um, and then they when, when the phones came back, they audited to see what had been done. Now they had uh, purposely um, installed some um, pictures and some financial information fake of, of course on these phones to see if the people at the repair shops would would access it and as you can see here um, based on 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 this research um, 11 of the 18 repair shops asked the user that was turning in the phone to give them the unlock pin even though it was completely unnecessary because the problem that they were um, uh, presenting was that I believe it was either the battery or the screen something that they would have not had to have gone into the phone um, to do the repair right so 11 asked the users to give them the unlock pin six copied data to an external source like an external hard drive and three even went as far as going into the phone after they had done that and removed tried to remove evidence that they had tampered or had tried to copy evidence and as you can see here by the chart in the in the national um, 
uh, level. Uh, there were uh, basically uh, the, the repair shops tried to access pictures, um, revealing pictures at the regional level. They did that. Plus they tried to access their documents folder. They tried to look at the browsing history and they tried to copy customers data. And they even went as far as clearing the quick access. And at the local level, well, as you can see, it was uh, a lot more. They, they pretty much got into a lot of different areas um, of the phone to try to, um, to get at data. And when females uh, were sent to uh, turn in the phones uh, for repair, uh, as you can see here um, at the local level, it was uh, a lot more likely that their phones were going to we're going to be inspected. So again, when when you're uh, when you're taking your devices to a repair shop, just keep this in mind. And there 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 are things that you could do. For example, don't give out your passwords to to the repair shops because most of the time they don't need that to repair your phone. Remove your SIM card if possible, and wipe the device. You can synchronize your device to your computer or you could sync it synchronize it to the cloud. You could wipe it before you take it out to repair, and then when you get it back. Uh, you could restore it. Media security. So modern copiers are sophisticated computing devices. They scan, store, print, and email documents before discarding the device or sending it back to the leaser. It's important to wipe the unit's hard drive to avoid someone else from having access, viewing, or printing your previously scanned and printed documents. And um, a lot of copier companies, when they lease you, a copier, they give you the option of uh, having them wipe the hard drive at the end of the leasing period, and that's part of the contract uh, where you pay a little extra money and knowing that they will do that. And there's another option where they will remove the hard drive and give it to you. That's if it had, not all copiers have hard drives, but a lot of the high end copiers really they do and they store everything. And um, I've been in places where, uh, you know, I I've seen that everything that that goes into the copier there's there's you see it on the screen there's the file and it and it stores it if that copier goes to another leasee uh, later on down the line and that hard drive is not wiped then that leasee will have access to all those documents that have been scanned or copied this allow BYOD devices for work uses. So what is a BYOD? It stands for bring your own device. And uh, it, was, it became very popular during the pandemic um, when laptops were scarce, where companies allowed uh, their employees to work from home and use their personal devices. This presents several problems. I am, I am against it. I believe that you should only use work devices that are managed uh, to conduct business. Phones uh, are one of probably the most common BYOD devices where employees allow in, um, their employees to access their corporate email by phones. And again, you you know uh, you can't tell people what to do with their personal phones, and that these phones might be in the hands of their children who are installing apps. Uh, you know, you never know what the security level on either a personal laptop or a personal phone might be. Phones also often, app, or apps on phones, often ask permission to read your contents of your email, your, your storage, your, your contact list. Again, you may be, um, uh, you're, you're commingling uh, personal and business, and you're allowing these apps to mine data that may be corporate data. Uh, so, um, if possible, uh, use you know uh, phones that are issued by the uh, by the company and limit um, or create policies or, 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 or put restrictions on installing apps on these phones. Just like computers, uh, phones when they're when they reach their end of life or when they're being upgraded. Uh, make sure that you wipe them. Computing and network devices may contain sensitive information. Creating policies that prohibit sensitive information from being stored on personal devices and always wipe your organization's devices before discarding, reselling, or recycling. And, and I read about this all the time where uh, researchers buy hard drives, they'll buy phones, they'll buy computers um, on on online marketplaces that are uh, used and they, they get them and these devices are full of 
other people's uh, personal information. So make sure that you wipe either your computer, your phone, your copier machine, your tablet um, before um, you know turning it in. And just because you send it to recycle, it doesn't mean that the recycler is going to uh, you know uh, crush it to bits and, or to take out each individual component and dismantle it. Yes, they may do that, but they may take out the storage unit and use that storage unit um, uh, for to sell it to someone. So yeah, again, uh, always wipe your devices. Flash drives, they're a very convenient way of passing information, but they also have their pitfalls. They may be used by some organizations to back up, store, and transport important data. They are small, they're easily lost, they're easily corrupted, they present a danger that should be addressed by policy and constraints. We always, by default, uh, try to block USB ports on the computers to prevent information from leaking onto USB drives or from being transported or even from having um, uh, uh, inst uh, a lot of times I see where um, employees uh, receive U information on a USB drive from uh, either one of their clients or they're working from home, they bring information from their home computer. If that USB drive it, uh, from that they plug into their home computer um, is infected by a virus, then they could pot potentially bring the virus to work. So that's why avoid USB flash drives if at all possible. Printouts and paper. Um, Although dumpster diving is not a thing anymore, right, um, uh, you should immediately shred sensitive documents when they are no longer needed. Um, back in the old days, hackers used to go dumpster diving. They used to go through the dumpster to look for discarded information that they could use. Uh, now that every, everybody's interconnected, it's really not necessary anymore, but it could still happen. And um, another thing is, um, you know, if you look at this photo here of all these papers lying in a desk, if those papers contain sensitive information, passwords, any, anything, uh, a person that walks by that desk or by that office or even the cleaning crew, they could be looking at um, sensitive information that you may not want anybody to look at. So always uh, lock um, your drawers uh, it, it, before you leave at the end of the day, take whatever papers that have sensitive information that may be lying around your desk and, and lock them in a drawer or lock your office. So what is the evil twin attack? Well, <clears throat> if you look at this photo here, uh, there's two girls, right? One is in blue and one is in red. And I told you one of them is nice and one of them is bad. Can you tell which one? Well, of course not, because with just that bit of information that one is blue, one is red, you have no way of knowing the difference. The evil twin attack is a bit the same way. Um, you have an access point. For example, you go to a, your favorite cafe and you look at there's a there's an, uh, a SID called, you know, cafe and there's another SID called cafe 5.0. And sometimes we see that because there's you have a 2.4, you have a 5.0. Uh, some routers broadcast two different SIDs, right? Uh, uh, for one for older laptops, one for newer that can support the higher frequencies. So how do you know which is real? How do you know if they're both belong to that cafe? And how do you know if one belongs to a hacker and the other one doesn't? You don't, it's very hard to tell. And even when you don't have two SIDs, you have one, um, somebody in that cafe could be sitting close by and with their laptop, they could be broadcasting the same identical SID with the same identical password, okay? And you may connect to them instead of to the real one. You have, it's almost impossible to tell the difference. And um, what happens is once you're connected to that, they start to proxy all your internet traffic and they could sniff your traffic. Um, and um, this leads you to things like a password where they could compromise and steal your passwords, they could steal your uh, login sessions, your login cookies, and then uh, impersonate you. So when you're in a public hotspot, it's really not a good idea to 
connect to any work-related services or to log into any of these work-related services. If you have to, uh, if you're somewhere and you, and you need to connect, the best thing to do is use your own hotspot on your own cell phone because you know what that the name of that hotspot and you know what the password to that is so it's not going to you nobody's going to be able to to trick you that way right whereas in in the evil twin attack as you can see here um the a hacker could could sit with his laptop and remember a laptop has a transponder right which has a transmitter and has a receiver so they could transmit a sid just like a router right so they can transmit an identical SID and most of the cafes they'll have a sign somewhere that tells you what the name of the SID is and what the password is the hacker could just copy that and so you could have two overlapping SID, SIDs and um, you know it's, it's just a matter of which one will you connect to you know you never know so again it's better to use your cell phone and as you can see here uh, once a um, a hacker is able to uh, get you to connect to their uh, fake uh, Wi-Fi, right? They could redirect you to fake websites where they can try to steal your credentials or your cookies. They could sniff your traffic and um, they can even mimic uh, SSL sites. So just because you're using a site that shows a little lock, um, you know, you think it's secure, that, that can also uh, be faked with a, a good sophisticated hacker can do that. So some routers, um, they proxy your internet connection. Our security software will block this unless the gateway is whitelisted and proxies and redirectors and self-signed self certificates are not only used by some gateways, but it's their tools used by hackers for phishing and evil twin attacks. This is why generally when you go to a hotel if, if and they're using their own gateway and there's no, uh, there, there's no uh, uh, public, publicly signed certificate, you get an error, you have to call the help desk Again, I recommend um, just using your cell phone as a uh, hotspot and, and this way we can avoid all this. Um, I picked this up from the internet where it tells you to avoid um, unsecured Wi-Fi hotspot. Um, but again, even, even secured Wi-Fi hotspots they're, they're, that are public, you should avoid. Use a VPN. This that can help, but it's not, you know, it's not a, uh, it's not a panacea. Okay, you could still uh, use a VPN and, and be connected to a rogue hotspot. Uh, use HTTPS again. You know, all these things they're great, but the only thing that's going to really, really help you um, is avoid using public Wi-Fi. And, and, and instead use your own personal cell phone hotspot. And by the way, if you have your computer or your phone to set up to connect or to auto connect to um, unsecured hotspots, you should have that setting turned off. Because even if you don't use it, your, your computer is still connected. And if there are other people on that hotspot, they could uh, try to um, attack uh, your computer. Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth, blue jacking, blue bugging, and blue snarfing are all Bluetooth attacks. Some attackers can conduct blue snarfing attacks from as far as 300 feet away from an unsuspecting victims. These attacks are directed to devices such as laptops, mobile phones, tablets, whose owners have left a Bluetooth connection open. A Bluetooth connection makes the device discoverable, which allows hackers to access the device without the user's permission. An attacker can then grab data off the device, such as text, email messages, calendar items, contact lists, and even potentials, potentially sensitive information such as passwords and personal media. So always make sure that you have the latest patches on your drivers on your laptop or that have Bluetooth or on your phones or tablets. Disable Bluetooth if you don't use it. Um, and especially make sure that you don't have it enabled when you're in crowded places. Don't accept or unknown uh, any unknown pair requests and only pair when you're at home or at work, not especially in crowded places. Um, check your Bluetooth pairing and unpair uh, any unused or unknown devices from your PC. And uh, there, there's usually settings where you can make 
uh, Bluetooth invisible and that would help, but it's not, it's not, it's not infallible. Uh, security by obscurity seldom works. If you look at the image here on the right, this is the settings on my Bluetooth and I have it set up that Bluetooth is disabled every time that I log into my computer. Um, and this is in case I'm forgetful, right? So when I first log in, Bluetooth is disabled. If I need to use it, I will enable it, knowing that in my next reboot, it will automatically be disabled. And it's just a, a secure way of configuring it. Thank you very much for attending the second part, and I hope to see you soon in part three.